part of it is just seeing adversity as an opportunity that even though it feels bad, that it's like, you know, it, it in sport, it's like a test of what you're capable of. But outside of sport, you know, shared experiences that are adverse experiences can enhance relationship connection. Welcome to the Low Tide Boys, a swim run podcast. I'm Chip. I'm Chris. This is episode 179 of the show. We have a mega show for everyone this week. Joining us in Studio G for discussion on the, quote, swim run relationship mm-hmm. is clinical psychologist, author, and all-around amazing human, Dr. Yael Schonbrom. This was a great conversation about partnership, values, and so much more, and we can't wait to share it with all of you. You should put the low-tie boys on the couch for a minute there, too. She did. She really <laughs> did. But first, <laughs> training update. So unlike our traditional, quote-unquote, training is moving right along with swimming and running as we barrel towards, insert race here, in this case, Casco <laughs> Bay. That we usually share this past weekend, we actually uh, we did a little thing. Yeah, we stayed on have, land. You may have you may have seen on on the Stravas. Uh, we ran the Marin Ultra Challenge 50k. So the Muck M U C K 50k. It's uh, sort of in our backyard here in Marin in the Marin Headlands. Just an amazing. Yeah, so we're spoiled to death here. It is very nice. We had a full day running in the mountains. Uh, we were focusing on a few things. One, uh, nutrition, pacing. Obviously, meme ideas, talking, ideating, uh, you know, what gear we should be doing, all sorts of things like that. While we're putting a big day on our feet for our prep for Atala. Yeah, it was fun. Um, I had a good time. Yeah, it took us like five hours and twenty five minutes or something like that. I can't remember exactly. I was I I was like some five twenty to five thirty somewhere in something that, like that. In that Ten minute um, window. Six thousand feet of climbing. Two thousand meters. Two thousand meters for the quick math. On yeah, that. good job. Good job. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was, it was a fun day. Definitely, definitely good to basically spend like five hours taking gels and other things and, and really just kind of thinking, you know, when we, after Atala last year, Mm -hmm. we realized that we needed to train more as sort of like ultra runners for this and really, yes, this is an amphibious sport, but there is a lot of cumulative running in the world championship and we wanted to make sure that our dogs weren't barking when we got to Orna and we thought, yeah, let's throw in some longer runs, big days, as our coach calls it. Uh, Nicholas Ramirez calls it. You know, basically, you have to have these long days in yep. the bank, um, not just from like a physical training perspective, but I, I'm sure you would co sign on this just from like a mental, just being like, all right, hey, we just busted out five and a half hours of activity. No problem. Like, that's good. Exactly. And, and yeah, we, we kind of talked about what we wanted to do and, and things to work on. And one of the things that are really cool about trail races is that they have like real food. And that was something for us at Atala. We had been really trained up on the gels and the PFH, but oh, there's regular kind of aid station food there. Yep. So even getting some of that in. Um, but also, yeah, just the opportunity to be really consistent. And I mean, for me, that was definitely, uh, like, uh, I mean, I I felt like it was a stretch on where my run volume has been. I've been kind of hovering around 30 miles a week since January, which is, I've been loving that, but this was definitely a stretch, (laughs) uh, for me. And I was really happy with, with how it all came out. And I think we've, we've talked about a lot and the, the fueling has been such a big unlock, for us last year and this year i'm like i feel like i'm going down a different level and um wait up a level down deeper deeper oh deeper yes deeper. but okay, yes yeah. leveling, leveling up, up and a, a yeah. deep, another <laughs> level deeper okay, so gotcha. i'm doing both i'm going up the stairs and down the stairs <laughs> um but yeah like what chris was saying i mean even during the race i was joking i'm like okay i feel not sick of gels but i'm forcing this one down i was like i'm forcing this gel down and yeah, there was maybe 40 minutes to an hour after, but my I've been trying to approach things as like, you don't have to bring the tank to zero. <laughs> like that's not a requirement. You finishing the race, you can finish the race and have plenty of, yeah. of fuel left. And that's uh, one thing that um, I've felt like I recover better. I have better energy after like, you know, imagine that. Sure, sure. Yeah, imagine I mean, and, and we we get that we have a little bit of a luxury where, yes, you awesome. know, we have official suppliers and the folks of Precision Fuel and Hydration, so we can yeah, we can take 10 gels if we want to, um, but I think despite that, I think if uh, you know, it's just good practice just to get used to taking as much nutrition as possible, because, I mean, 
I'm sure you would agree with this as well. Like we were feeling pretty good afterwards. The next day was fine. Yeah. We went on a run today, basically two days after a really big effort and it yeah. was totally fine. And I think part of that is just making sure that we are eating well and not just totally just getting in the bag in terms on the nutrition hydration side of things. I mean, absolutely. I've done, we've done races that have been two hours, half marathons that I've been like just on the couch after like totally just <laughs> KO'd basically. Yeah. Uh, and this one I'm, even my wife has commented like, oh, wow, you seem to have way more energy than you normally do after these big days and everything. So uh, people are noticing, I suppose. That's good. So that's good. Anyway, enough about me and us. Uh, <laughs> let's get to this week's shout outs. Yeah. So this week we're shouting out Dry Robe for sponsoring the show last month. We just want to give them one last big shout out. It was really, it was really, it was a blast for us. Um, to get to check out their new dry rope light. And we encourage everyone to check it out. We'll be rocking ours at Casco Bay later this yeah. summer in case anyone wants to see one of these awesome pieces of kit up close. But you can get yours at dryrope.com. Link in the show notes, link on our website. Highly recommend it. Go further, dry rope light. Thanks again, guys. Appreciate you. We also have a video on YouTube and our IG uh, for the Gear Talk quick hits. On yeah. That if you want to see with your eyeballs as well. Mm-hmm. Now... Wisdom nugget of the week. If you can't imagine it, you can't have it. Toni Morrison. Amazing author. Highly recommend her work. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, man. If, if, if you can't even think of it as a possibility, yeah. you don't deserve it. So if you don't think you can show up there and have a great race and have a great experience or whatever it is you're trying to do, I mean, you know, first thought is, is believing is possible. And yeah. this is something I feel like the wisdom nuggets of the, week, of the week have all been around this theme. It's like, hey, man, you have to believe <laughs> that you can do it before you actually do it. Yeah, I mean, that that's totally true. And I the, the, we have had a good thematic uh, on the on the wisdom nuggets. But, uh, you know, that the mind, how powerful the mind is and how mm. much you can just have it do uh, do really positive things for you um, without really changing anything besides your mindset. Yep. There you go. Now, for this week's Feats of Endurance. So we haven't done this segment in a few weeks, so we're giving out two awards. You know. Yeah, why not? We do our own thing right Whatever the hell we want. (laughs) First up is Sasha for posting a swarm on workout in the town of Frickhausen, Germany. I think it's a Frickenhausen. Frickenhausen, Germany. Safe to say anyone posts a workout from Frickenhausen. There's a good chance you're going to win an award. Yeah. So, so frickin' housing or Puerto ju- Rico? Yeah, I think we just added another auto category. All right. <laughs> well, congrats on that one, Sasha. The second award goes to Luke Hutchinson for completing the Unbound Gravel 200, formerly known as the Dirty Kanza, which is a 200-mile, grueling 200-mile gravel race that takes place every year in Kansas. It's... Uh, it's a and, beast. And it's it's like uh, definitely a one on the pinnacle of gravel gravel bike races so nice strong work on that luke i know there's a sofa that a lot of people take pictures with on the yes, couch it's there. at a, a big turnaround you okay. go to this like stinky sofa and yeah sit it sit down on it with your bike or something and yeah well it's like the uh, mandatory race pick at swim run nc on top of the <laughs> on top of the mountain sort of maybe they should lug yeah. a lug a sofa up there <laughs> oh my god can that you imagine be, they'd probably get oh. a hella hella lift a uh, helicopter drop it off anyway make sure you head on over to strava search low tie boys join the strava club there as uh, swim runners and just folks from around the world as they train for uh, stuff and mostly swim runs we're hoping <laughs> yeah now over to the news desk for a ra- rather extended this week in swim run All right, now for the news. So we're kicking off this edition of This Week in Swim Run with another in our special ad hoc series, Race Director Reports, with our friend and race director, Nicholas Roman, about this year's EX Swim Run Super Sprint, EX 23 Long and Short Events. We loved his enthusiasm when we had him on the show way back when, and that when we first interviewed him was actually two years ago in 2001. We've had him back every year, mm-hmm. and... You'll you'll be you'll be happy to know Chipper. He's still super stoked. So let's hear awesome. from Nicholas to get a little race report from EX Swim Run. Hi guys, Nicholas here from EX Swim Run. 
wrapping up a hugely successful EX swim run party weekend in Stockholm Solentuna. And this past weekend we hosted the first races in the Swedish swim run race calendar with the Arc Super Sprint on Saturday and then the EX23 long and short course on Sunday. And the Super Sprint, as always, a really, really cool race to host and an even cooler race to follow and watch live at Edsvik or in the live feed that we had with Oscar Olsson and Shane Chaplin doing a play-by-play -play commentary and following the racers around the 1.2-kilometer short course. And if you saw that race, you know who won. We had Sabina Rapelli from Switzerland arriving in a taxi, changing into her wetsuit in the taxi from Arlanda Airport to make it to her first qualification heat. She won every heat after that and sailed through straight to the final and took the, the trophy swim run super sprint, ARC super sprint champion 2023. And on the male side, we had Johan Skåbratt also powering through all the heats made it to the final and took the trophy as the male champion in the ARC Super Sprint. So a really, really cool race. If you haven't seen it, you can see all the heats on our Instagram. You can go in and follow them uh, live by live or play by play uh, with Oscar Olsen and Shane Chaplin. And then on Sunday, we had the EX23 long and short course and we had over 300% more participants than last year. So we were up about 200 participants, which is a lot of people in a swim run race. And we had some really cool and adventurous weather. It was sunny, but it was also really windy. So there was a huge chop out on the ocean or on the bay, which was causing some swimmers a challenge and some were using it to surf along. And a really, really cool race. We did the mass start for the short course and they took off in their white bibs. And then we started our pursuit start only five minutes afterwards. So they started chasing the short course and having two races going at the same time on the course. It meant that the racers were meeting each other, you know, giving high fives, cheering each other on and navigating in and out of Iatsvik and all the way down to a bridge that you have to cross. And then you can come back to Edsvik. Unfortunately, we couldn't do the jump. Uh, the water level is about 45 centimeters below average. So we went and we checked the take the jump out with sonar and everything and we, we deemed it too dangerous to jump. So we weren't jumping. But besides that, we had another element of surprise for all the races. We had mad geese along the course that were nesting on one island and they started attacking all the racers. So you had to use your paddles to <laughs> punch a geese like Duck Hunt back in uh, the Nintendo 64 days. So and always an element of surprise at EX. And uh, we had a great day. You can check out our site, see all the pictures and uh, all the great stuff that we did this weekend. And now we're just recovering. Me, Par and Elizabeth, the organizers, we've done three, five races in two days and we're pretty tired right now, but we're charging up for the next swim run race. We're going to do a race in a week or two, I think, starting racing ourselves. So just a quick wrap up of the EX23 weekend. Check out the site, check out the Instagram and you can follow all the races and check out all the pictures and keep being awesome guys. Talk to you soon. Pretty cool. Another another smashing success there and it it's been great to see how uh EX has grown and evolved over over mm -hmm. the years as you said this is uh this is uh the second third yeah. year. And it's so great to see like what's possible with swim run and oh, you know we say it all the you know ideas are cheap <laughs> cheap yeah. as dirt but to take an idea turn it into a thing turn it into an event have like really good coverage have everyone be super stoked on it i mean it's just it's fantastic it's yeah fantastic. and i was loving the uh media coverage they had as well they mm -hmm. had oscar olsen on i uh, hopefully a bike he was going pretty quick so <laughs> hopefully it wasn't like running the whole time but I mean, he probably could run he, he definitely <laughs> could but the course uh action packed uh it was a, it was a great time there to, to live along in the season is popping off already. Good stuff. Yeah, in other news, there were a slew of swim runs taking place all over Europe. In Sweden, Jonas Kolting's Boras swim run, which incidentally he was wearing a limited edition Low Tide Boys Attila edition hat, which is great. Um, that race took place and looked like a good time was had by all. In Portugal, the Tamega swim run, which we recently highlighted in a course preview episode, and it also happens to be the first Attilo Merit race in Portugal, went off without a hitch, and literally all the photos look epic. Like, every single one I saw, I was like, damn. It did. I was reading the race report on swimrun.com from Fred and Alex. They teamed yeah. up 
for that race. Uh, beast. Beast. Beast of a day. That yeah. One. Well, remember when uh, what they were talking about in the race part, there's these walls you have to climb up. Mm-hmm. It seemed Literally. pretty wallish. Yeah. It seemed very wallish. Finally, over in Spain, the swimmer in Costa Azahar looked as magical as ever. So if you ever in that wild coast of Spain, highly recommend trying that event. Meanwhile, here in the United States, the Bellingham Storm Run is taking place this weekend in beautiful Bellingham, Washington. If you need a real estate agent in that area, we have a recommendation for you. There's still time for folks to get their flights together. So if you're waiting for the last minute, now's your time to shine. Also, make sure to check out our Coast Preview episode for this local gem of a race. Finally, here in California, we only have one swim run. Why? It's a really good question. But it's happening on July 29th in Folsom, California. We've said it before, but if we want to help grow the sport in the United States, we need to show up to races. So come join us for the Folsom Storm Run for this fun, beginner, friendly event. And if you need any additional incentive, Chipper. Besides meeting us? Besides me, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That, that, that's probably a disincentive for some folks. Use the code LTB10 to save 10% off of your registration. We did this race last year. The inaugural event had super fun. Our families were there. Yeah. Great, great, great time on the river. Easy to make a, a little weekend out of it. Sacramento and specifically yep. Folsom area has a lot of great stuff. It's also yep. where I was married. So, yep. you know, it's nice. But we'll see you there at the end of July. Uh, register up for that one. Yeah. Well, that's it for this week. Reach out to us if there's any swimmer news you'd like for us to share on the show. Yes, now for a little bit of show business. So we had an idea for an episode called, quote, When Life Imitates Memes. And we need your help, you the listener. Did a dog (laughs) literally bite you in the butt during a race? Did you think of something that poked you in the water only to realize it was your partner's paddle? You get the idea. All you have to do is send us a DM or an email with an audio clip of your funniest slash potentially weirdest swim run experience for a chance to get that shared in a forthcoming episode. Yeah. This will be a fun show. Essentially, the format is people give us clips, mm-hmm. and then we, we riff on them. So, you know, Should pretty, be. pretty standard stuff. Some a little different. <laughs> we'll be, I think we can handle that. I think so. So send that over to us uh, via DM on the Instagrams or, or email there, lowtieboys at gmail.com, to get all that sorted up. Or you can pin us something as well. Um. We're already planning for the Odyssey Swim Run Casco Bay. Cannot wait for that. Time mm-hmm. is ticking. We are at four weeks. Yeah, a month. Chuck's watch, Chuck's calendar. We wanted everyone to pencil in some dates and times on their calendar. <clears throat> Get your notepads out, folks. First, Saturday, so the day before the race, July 7th at 10 a.m., we'll be coast- co-hosting a shakeout swim run with ARC Sports, Dry Robe, Wild Swim Run, and Team Envol at East End Beach. This is a popular area that Chris mm-hmm. and I usually frequent uh, a day before the race to do our own little shakeout, so we thought we'd invite everyone and our friends along as well. Yeah. So, also on July 7th at noon, we will be hosting our second annual Low Tide Boys Patreon luncheon before we head on over to the packet pickup. So that's exclusive. Exclusive for our Patreon <laughs> folks. So thank you for that. A a nice little lunch there. Finally, on July 8th, the day of the race, we'll be hosting our third annual post-race party. Location TBD at the moment, but likely the same place as last year. We are looking for a few things. One, food. Two, beer. Three, large areas to hang around with swim runners. (laughs) That's our requirements. So stay tuned for all the Facebook uh, event invites in in the next couple weeks, Uh, but... Uh, that weekend, we have a bunch of stuff for you there. Uh, really looking forward to uh, the first Odyssey Swim Run of the year. Yeah, it's wild that this will be the third post-race party. <sighs> this is our fourth trip out there. It's, it's wild. The, I mean, it's, it's a thing. It's a thing. It's I'm I'm happy for it to be a thing. Yeah. It's a great, always a great time. But yes, third annual post-race uh, beer meetup there. Now, without any further ado, let's jump into our conversation with Dr. Yael Schombrun. Yeah, it was really great to talk to Yael. I mean, she's a wealth of knowledge on all things relationships, and it was cool to get her take on what makes for, you know, great swim run partnerships. Yeah. Um, we talked about all kinds of stuff in this conversation. As Chipper mentioned at the beginning of the show, we kind of got put on the on the therapist couch there for a little bit. Um, and I really, I think it's really safe to say that teams and also solo swim runners alike will take away a lot from her wisdom. Um yeah, it was just it was just a really cool chat. Yeah, I mean, it's just really 
I, I like it because we, you know, it's easy to think, oh, swim runs like physical running and swimming and let me do this and what gear do I need? But there's also the whole partnership aspect that you can really has a huge implication on mm-hmm. your, your enjoyment of the race. Um, yep. So you're able to get some really actionable tips uh, and things that you can work on, whether it's, you know, uh, you're in a situation like Chris and I, like training training partners for, for a decade plus here, or you have never met before and you're doing your own race, there's still things that you can do to make your swim run experience that much better and enjoyable, which is, you know, what we're trying to do for everybody here. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think uh, there's just a lot of a lot of analogies for, you know, your personal relationships, your work relationships, and yeah. also your swim run relationships. So, yeah, this was great. Um, really, we're not worthy of having her join us on our corner of the internet but we're super happy that <laughs> she happened. that she said yes and we think you're gonna love this conversation so absolutely so enjoy the doctor is in dr il that is let's jump into our conversation <laughs> Okay, very excited for this conversation. Welcome to the show, Dr. Yael Schonbrum, clinical psychologist, assistant professor at Brown University, co-host of the Psychologist Off the Group podcast, mom of three, author. Her latest book is called Work, Parent, Thrive, 12 Science-Backed Strategies to Ditch Guilt, Manage Overwhelm, and Grow Connection When Everything Feels Like Too Much. It's an amazing book. Highly recommend it. Welcome to the show, Yael. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you guys today. And and I think I'm excited to learn from you. Hopefully I have something to teach too, but I'm excited to learn more about Swim Run and what you guys do and how you partner and all that. <laughs> well, we're super stoked to have you. This is a conversation that, um, you know, full disclosure, Yael and I work together. So, you know, I've been learning about her, learning about her work and I always try to find ways to apply everything I do to swim run. And I think your work on relationships is just really interesting. And a lot of the way, you know, behavior and, and how to create the best relationships that are nurturing and relational and all that stuff. So before we get into sort of a specific application for swim run, um, would love to hear just kind of like what are your, in your view, what makes for a good relationship, a good partnership, whether in sport and life and whatnot? Yeah, that's a great question and very multifaceted. (laughs) Um, I mean, I think, you know, having fun together, like feeling connected and having fun. So some of that positivity in relationships is so important. And then finding meaning in the hard stuff together. And I hope that we'll talk a bit about that today because I think, you know, part of doing sport as a duo is – going through adversity together and feeling connected as you do it. And that's a part of good, healthy relationships too. Um, The other elements that I think are really critical are having a growth mindset as a relationship in a relationship. So this idea that relationships are these living, breathing entities that are always growing and evolving and, and bringing that mindset into it so that when things are difficult between you and your partner, that you don't see it as a sign that there's something wrong with the relationship, but rather as an opportunity to learn and grow as individuals and as a, as a partnership. And I think curiosity is a really critical ingredient for healthy relationships because that's sort of how you figure out what it is that's going well and that you can celebrate and what it is that needs to be twe- tweaked and that you can approach with that growth mindset. Um, and then the other part, this is really informed by the kind of therapy that I practice as a clinical psychologist, and it's called acceptance and commitment therapy. But we talk a lot about values, sort of how you want to show up moment to moment in whatever role you're in. And so having a sense of your different values, sort of what you each bring to the table in terms of what's important to you, and then your shared values, what's important to the two of you as a team, as a partnership, and really um, accessing those and tapping into them and using that as a compass, especially when things are hard or confusing or or just, you know, the, the road feels unclear for the moment. Which so is like every yellow. swim run. Yeah, the, I the bet. Road is confusing it looks, and unclear, unclear sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Where so are we true. going? What are we doing? It's a really cool sport. I, I have to admit, I'd never heard of it before Chris told me about it, but it's I okay. was having a fun time looking at the videos with my three boys who are intrigued. Oh, I mean, I for- actually, I, there's a, I live in the Boston area and there's a Cape Cod swim run event this summer. So I was like, ooh, maybe we can try to attend. That'd nice. Fun. There is, there is. Uh, one particular low tide boy is likely going to be in uh, an attendance because I want to be in town for work. So, uh, 
Oh. Yeah, it's, almost, it's not me. Yeah, it's, it's not, yeah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Chipper. Well, Chris, maybe we should try to negotiate yeah. the gathering. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. That'd be super fun. So, um, yeah, so, so that, so by way of background, I think, I think, you know, when it comes to swim run, I think one of the things that's really interesting is this concept where, you know, there's just always adversity, no matter what's going on, whether it's yeah. the course being super challenging conditions, whatever it is, but also, um, from a partnership perspective, um, you know, partners are never totally, totally equal on everything, right? Pace wise, running wise, swimming wise. I mean, I'm feeling that acutely on the swim because I'm trying to, I'm always trying to, I'm always trying to keep up with Chipper, but I took a break from swimming and now I feel like I'm really trying to catch up and sort of, I have to be okay with that, (laughs) that we're not going to be exactly the same and nor, nor do you really have to. Mm -hmm. So, um, so do you have any recommendations on, on like, you know, I mean, that to me, that seems like a super common thing, right? Like no one's coming to relationships 100% equal, both fitness or mental or whatever. Um, you know, how, how, how would you approach that in your practice? Yeah. So I often think about differences and even differences in strengths from a sort of Taoist mindset, so this sort of yin-yang. And I think that we often see differences in partnerships as a bad thing. But kind of what you're saying, like you can sort of help each other out. If one person is really strong in one area, it creates a balance that the other person does, can sort of allow the the person who has more strength to lead and you can follow. But the other thing that's important to recognize is you pull each other up. So if one person is weaker, if Chipper is a stronger swimmer and Chris, you're, you're less strong, you may be motivated to kind of meet him in the middle. And when we see differences from that light, that it's okay because we can balance each other and we can help each other grow and and sort of meet in the middle and create that healthy ecosystem where like, you know, you have different strengths that are within the entirety, then it it creates a sense of complementarity as opposed to a sense of adversarialness or, or, or a sense of inadequacy, right? Because you're helping each other out, you're helping each other grow. And I, I do think that it, I guess it depends on what the weakness is and if you want to be growing together or if you can just sort of let the person who's in the lead. But it's often the case that the person who feels weaker can feel like dead weight, like the other person is dragging them along. And so I think rather than just kind of allow yourself to be in that position of saying, well, you know, it just is what it is, you can see it as an opportunity to push yourself. And I think that's true in, you know, relationships outside of swim run too, that you can see, for example, you know, one person is really good at managing finances and the other person has more experience in parenting. But if you sort of enter into it with, okay, I'm not just going to let you take over everything. I'm going to allow you to learn me, to teach me, to educate me, and I'll be the learner and the grower and, and bring the thing, the areas that I am stronger in, in ways that enhance whatever it is that, that I have to, uh, to bring to the table. Yeah, I really like that uh, approach there. And I think we've kind of tried to work that into some of our training this year is like really leaning into, hey, Chris is a a better runner or stronger on the hills and I'm better in the water. Like, how can we lean into these strengths? Um, And 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 Chris has been really working on this as well. And I've it's like if one of us is better, that's better for the team. We're, We're together. We're we're one. And sort of if I am fast swimming faster great we're we're both swimming faster than we were last year so overall it's uh, from a team uh, aspect and, and lens it's it's really a net positive um but but it is hard to kind of keep in that that mindset a, a lot is there what what are some things that that folks can do to to really make sure they're it's it's hard to do <laughs> to keep in that uh you know positive positive mindset all the time especially if you're yeah, you know, I, only staring at feet or only looking at the back of somebody <laughs> when they're running up the hill faster than you. Yeah, and I think especially in sport because it's just there's like just sort of a natural competitiveness to it where it's like, you know, chipper swimming faster than me, literally next to me in the pool. You know, I can either take that as like, oh man, chipper once again he's just kicking my butt, or we can be like, I'm stoked because he's going really well. That's going to help the team effort. But uh, but yeah, but it's kind of hard to just always kind of be in that state of mind. Yeah. I mean, do you find, Chris, that if you're swimming next to Chipper, that you swim faster than when you're swimming alone? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Well, so what, what, what would predict the difference of you swimming faster versus not? Yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think it depends partly on whatever workout we're doing. If it seems like, like a pretty good benchmark to what it'll be kind of like on race day. So we do a lot of swimming where there's like, you're basically wearing your full gear, like 
swim paddles and a big pool buoy. So for stuff like that, I try to like, um, if, if Chipper and I are starting at the same time, um, just trying to kind of get a good sense of where he's at because if it's like, oh yeah, swim, whatever, 500 yards at 80%, it's helpful for me to know kind of what that means for him because it might not mean the same for me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when we don't, I mean, I, I think it depends. I mean, I'm pretty self-motivated, so I can definitely get after it by myself. But, um, but yeah, definitely this year, um, seeing him swim, I mean, I'm just super proud of him. He's been putting in a ton of work and, and doing, been doing super well. So as Chipper mentioned, like it does help the team. I don't mind him leading the swims. There's no ego attached to that. So, you know, he can just have at it and I'll just stay on his feet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely been a journey for me because, you know, we did triathlon together and that's just, you know, that's just a solo time trial that you train with buddies. But at the end of the day, it's just like, what's the number at the end where swim run is, is definitely more, more of a team journey and, and the reward at the end feels really different. Yeah. So have you guys ever talked about your values, sort of why you do it? What are the values that you share and what are the values that are unique to each of you in terms of what motivates you to do this crazy sport? (laughs) Yeah, I think we've hammered it out uh, loosely. <laughs> we don't have, uh, I don't know, we don't have a frame. We don't have it thing. framed up or anything uh, on the in the. You don't have your mission statement. <laughs> uh, it's mostly in the head, but but yeah, I think we're we're pretty. I think we're pretty aligned on on that stuff, and I mean, we've been training partners for over a decade. I don't know, now we're point. going on ten years, probably. So I mean, there's a lot of reps in there that we. Um, what is that? Is that like your silver? What's ten years? Did you celebrate oh. your 10 year oh, anniversary? I'm giving Chip, Chipper's I'm getting, getting a Chris gold some, watch. Oh, I was going to get you some oh. nice dinnerware. <laughs> some nice china <laughs> plate. Oh, nice. Perfect. <laughs> um, I guess gold watch is retirement. So I'll take the gold that. watch, man. I'll take a gold watch, but when you get placed, you're going to be upset. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think we've definitely... We've def. I mean, we've had guests on the show where we talk about mindset. We have Brad Stolberg and Susie Moon and a bunch of really great sort of folks on on the mental side of the sport. And I think we definitely have our why sorted out. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, we 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 truly enjoy spending time together. So when Swimmer came around, it was like, hey, here's a here's an interesting way for us to share some miles, um, you know, or yeah. yards in the pool together because we're already kind of doing that anyway. We're um, you know. As Stripper mentioned, basically been training together in some capacity for for at least ten years. Um, so, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I guess if if you're asking what our why is, our why is to to have fun, to sort of experience new things, and to essentially see what we're capable of, but not in like a you know we're trying to qualify for the Olympics or anything, but just seeing like, hey, you know, we're doing this thing together. Um, how much can we apply? how much seriousness can we apply to it um, at any given time? And also understand that, you know, we're trying to do a lot of things well. We're trying to be good dads. We're trying to be good husbands. We're trying to be good sons and friends and employees. Um, And it's, you know, can't be 10 out of 10 out of all that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, though, because you sort of contextualize it, that it's this thing that you're trying to excel at and push yourself, but also it happens inside of a very full life. And you guys really try to honor all the different parts of your lives that um, of of which this is one. And my guess is a lot of the time it really contributes to the other pockets of life. But when it feels like it's starting to leak in in unhelpful ways, you might set some some boundaries around that. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where our communication as to that is, I think, is definitely gotten better over the years in terms of, um, you know, no one's expecting to be able to read anyone's mind in this swimmer partnership. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, understanding when it's like, okay, so we're racing the world championship in September again, that's obviously, you know, an A race for us, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the most important race in our calendar for the year. So, Understanding that, that means not everything can be an A race. So we're doing a race in July in in Maine that we want to do really well at. And it's a great sort of, you know, tune tune up, so to speak, for for the world championship. But we're not trying to kill ourselves on that one. We're just trying to work on things, communication, nutrition, you know, all that stuff. And sort of check off a bunch of sort of training boxes with that race. Um, and And yeah, just... 
but that that's also a shared understanding between us right yeah. that 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 not everything can just be we, we can't just go ballistic every single race yeah. So you sort of communicate in advance, this race is going to be one where we really, you know, empty the gas tank versus this is one where we're more working on technique. Can I ask a question just because I'm curious, and I had said this before we started the recording, how much do you communicate during a race? Like if you run into an obstacle, I'm sure that there's just a lot of chaos and literal noise and, you know, noise in your head, but <laughs> how do you communicate and let one another know how you're going to tackle, you know, an obstacle that's come up or, or it, if an obstacle is like your body is not feeling it right and you want to sort yeah. of just change this tactic right in the middle of the race, how do you handle that? How do you communicate with one another? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. It's evolved definitely for sure, especially as our swim run sort of we've matured in, in swim run. Um, I think before we were much more verbally communicative about, oh, hey, I'm take the pace up, take the pace down kind of thing now. Or if there is a obstacle, maybe, oh, we missed a turn or should we try to go around this team or not? I think now we're in a better place in terms of um, having more trust in whoever's leading, usually whatever. Yeah, either the run or the swim of like, hey, you can you can just go for it. You can make the call yourself because we we feel like we're we have enough connection, I guess, to to just have have that trust uh, in the person in, in front that they're going to make the right decision um, because we've already sort of established everything before about how we're going to approach the race, what pacing we're going to go, where we're going to have our nutrition. Like we have a pretty solid plan to start. So when there is these little variables in there, it's not a huge to do or, or mental sort of exercise to, to uh, make a call. It's like just go with the flow kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes it'll be like, um, like if we're gonna make a move on the run, because uh, there's just like a bunch of people we want to kind of get around them or whatever it is. Like sometimes I'll just like if I'm leading the run, I'll just look back at Chipper, and he'll just, you know, give me like a little <laughs> nod or whatever, or like before I even ask him the question, he'll be like, "Yeah, go for it," kind of thing. So we definitely have enough reps, I think, to yeah. to be able to do that. But yeah, as Chipper said, I think it's definitely evolved where. Um, we used to communicate a ton and just kind of like shoot the shit or whatever. And then once we started getting quicker, we communicated less and we're just more task oriented. And then, um, at the world championship last year, we made a conscious decision to just be like over communicative (laughs) just because it's such a long day. There's so much going on. It's like, Hey, you know what? Like, I'm just going to tell you every time I take a piss or something, you know, just like, (laughs) you just need to know every time I'm taking a jail for the next 10 hours, I'm just going to tell you. (laughs) And, um, you know, maybe it was overkill, but it was just like, it's such a long day. There's so many moving pieces. And the longer the event, the more it's just like, I'm just going to get out of my head. Um, same thing if there's like an injury or a niggle or something like that. Um, some other races, you might just suck it up and just not say anything because you don't want to feel like the weakest link or you don't want to sort of derail the situation. But um, sometimes you just have to let people know. So the world championship, like my right shoulder started bugging me a little bit after I think like a third or half of the way through. And I just told Chipper, <laughs> it's like, Hey man, just so you know, my shoulder's kind of bugging me a little bit. And it was just like, okay, no problem. Um, and he led, he led the rest of the swims and, you know, just, he was totally capable of doing that. If I had to lead a swim, it would, you know, it would have yeah. gotten done, but it was just like, we were in the place where, okay little mini plan B, same thing. We usually write our information like on our paddles, like the different legs so that kind of you kind of know what's going up ahead. And it's gotten to the point where uh, Chipper, and this is usually Chipper's job, he writes it on his paddles, like it, it hit it uh, worn off or something. <laughs> it was like, hey, how far is this run? He's like, oh, I don't know, we're off. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, no worries. Let's just keep going. Whereas I think maybe a couple of years ago, that might've been like, oh man, like now we don't know what's happening. For sure, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. I think the, well, the, the reps it, component is, is definitely key. It sounds like you guys have kind of automated a lot of your communication. Like, like you know who's in charge, you know, in swim versus run, and you have a plan in place, and you kind of trust each other to make decisions on the fly. And so you don't need to sort of have this active, explicit communication most of the time, but that when you do, sometimes it's nonverbal, sometimes it's verbal, but it, it sounds like that's sort of more out of outside of what you typically do now you're more like it's kind of automatic the decisions have already it, been made it, i think it happens ahead of, of time it happens yeah. ahead of time because we'll spend usually either the flight to the race or the night before the race 
kind of just going over a strategy. So there's a lot of stuff. With Swim Run, there's so many different moving pieces that the more you can automate, the more you can just have it be sort of like automatic, like transitioning in and out of the water. You know, there's all these things you got to fiddle with. And the more you kind of have that sorted, the less you need to think about it and the more you can actually, you know, being in a flow state is, is, is a strong word for, for the way we do it. But, you know, you get into this swim run flow where you're just moving seamlessly in and out of the water. And if you can do it really fast and graceful, it's really fun and looks great. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great experience to have. But a lot of that happens beforehand where it's like, okay, we're going to do this here. We're going to do that there. What's our nutrition plan? What are, what are we thinking in terms of this swim and that? Yeah. So then when it comes to race, if there is some sort of adversity, um, we just sort of – then just, you know, iterate in in the moment. Yeah. But this sounds very similar to what um, psychologists recommend that couples do, for example, when they have young kids. It's like you have the conversations at the front end about like who's going to take on what tasks and how it's going to go and, um, you know, what are like sort of minimum standards of care. This is language from an author by the name of Eve Rodsky, who has this book called Fair Play that is all about division of household responsibilities. And and the whole goal of her model is that you have the hard conversations on the front end and you kind of automate things because life is so full and so overwhelming. And so if you can make the weeks uh, a little bit more seamless by doing that front end conversation, then it can feel a little bit more graceful as you go. But also you need to be flexible because stuff comes up and then you need yeah. to be able to communicate more on the fly in those moments. But-, but you kind of reduce the load by doing a lot of the front end work. And the other thing that I'll point out just in terms of growth mindset that, you know, for listeners who are newer to swim run is that it sounds like it was a lot more effortful at the front end. And now it's gotten just a lot more automatic because you've built these skills of how to communicate both in the lead up and during a race. And so what used to feel like you needed to have a lot of communication around it and was a little bit clunkier has now gotten very seamless and almost automatic because you've practiced it so much. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. And, and you know, we do definitely need to acknowledge like Chris and I are on the like veteran sort of more veteran status of swim run and there's people that literally show up to a race and they've never done it together before and they're going to go and they're going to take the race on so i think applying some of these things about hey maybe if you're you know before you're like chris and i we can't wait there's this place called Otto's pizza in portland maine it's our, been our go-to for four years we get some this pizza but you're having your pizza before you're talking about your race if you're a brand new partner that would be a good place to kind of apply these like hey there's the run component, there's swim component, there's nutrition, and maybe talk about that if you have a brand new partner, and that could be really uh, save you a lot of headaches during during the race because we've heard stories of uh, you know partners kind of uh, blowing up or going at each other <laughs> during a race if, if there's a uh, some event there, so you can you can avoid that if you're on the newer side with your partnership. All right, so here's like your tell all moment. Have you guys ever had a blow up in the middle of a race? No. We Physically, have yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not emotionally. Yeah, not, no. not, not emotional. Um, you've had, I think, you haven't had huge conflict in the middle of a race. You know, we haven't. And I think I think there's a couple reasons for that. One is that our partnership in, in many ways, and this is going to sound cheesy, is based in love. Right? So it's like, I love Chipper. He's one of my best friends. We're out here to have fun and take care of each other. And for me, the most important thing is maintaining that. Um, and whatever happens in the race, it's just a, you know, it's just a race. Um, even if it's a super important to us or, or whatever. So I think because we come at it from that, I think we, we never get like unkind with each other. It might be like, like, you know, we might be snippy in the sense of like, okay, just go straight dude or something like that. Like (laughs) some straight, like, like, like cues like that, but nothing like, oh my God, dude, you totally screwed this race up. Like what the fuck, you know, like it never, it's never gotten to that point with us. And I don't think it ever will because, you know, for us, our friendship is, is the, is the linchpin of all this thing. Not like, you know, getting a gold medal or something. Yeah. Yeah. We're not trying to bury each other. Yeah. Well, (laughs) I mean, that's so lovely. And that's, you know, such a nice model for relationships in general, right? Is like, if you can hold the relationship and the togetherness is like the highest why and all the other stuff of, you know, day to day life as, you know, something that's fun to do or important to do, or, you know, aligns with your goals, then it feels much better. Because at the end of the day, what really matters is that you're in it together. 
that you, you know, you're able to show one another that you care about each other more than the other things. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's what we found. And that's some of like the, the steadfast advice that we give to new people is like, make sure your goals about the race are generally about like, if someone's trying to like, I'm going for the top step on the podium and someone else is like, I'm just trying to take pictures and make a GoPro video the whole time. Like you're going to have a wildly different experience. <laughs> uh, so try to get like kind of on the same page yeah. uh, there. And then your, your expectations are at least uh, in the same universe. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say too, though, is that, I mean, I'm, I'm sure because you are competing at very high levels that you're physically uncomfortable. So it's actually remarkably, it's remarkable that you don't lay into each other more because usually when people are, you know, in pain in physical pain, it's very easy to take it out on somebody who's close to you, who you trust. So it's kind of amazing that you're able to um, circumvent that by keeping connected to that value of like this friendship is the most important thing. Yeah, I think like our probably our I don't want to say I don't know, not our worst not our worst race per se, but the one where we had the most difficulty was where I was I was bonking really hard and Chris was like feeling like a million bucks. So there was this like physical mismatch that we had going on. Um and that was the one that I I feel like probably after that race in retrospect, we looked at, we're like, okay, we probably could have communicated better on that because we kind of both went into like, oh boy, this is going to be a, this is going to be an ordeal here, dragging Chipper's ass around uh, uh, upstate Washington. And um, how can we do, just get it over with kind of thing? And so that's sort of the mode that we went into. What we've done, we've been in that mode before, whether it was on the bike or some crazy trail run or something. So that part wasn't unfamiliar to us, but. Um, I think in retrospect, when we looked on, it's like, okay, we probably could have handled a little bit better. We got it done. You know, no one bit each other's head off or anything like that. But that was probably our biggest, uh, I don't know, what would you call that, Chris? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was definitely, you know, when we talk about sort of dealing with adversity, that one was one where, yeah, yeah I mean, I think the verse, the, it was, yeah, so Chipper had an epic four hour bonk, which, if, not, not if you've ever had a four-hour bonk <laughs> and still come out the other side and still actually do a pretty decent time, I mean, it was it was it was impressive in hindsight. During it had to really suck for Chipper. I mean, and and for me, it definitely sucked because again, I was feeling like I've never felt so. I was just, I was in just this weird state. I was just super strong the whole day, feeling super strong. Like I could have. If I was racing by myself, I either would have set the you know set the course record or had the most epic blow up in the history of epic <laughs> blow ups because I was just you know, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, but th but that adversity w was interesting because it was definitely like, and again, as Chipper mentioned, I think we learned a lot from that one because on the one hand, I was feeling super strong and I was just trying to get us to the finish line, but on the other hand, I was also like, all right, Chipper really doesn't want me talking to him about his four hour bonk, so I'm just gonna put my head down and just you know, pull on the tether and just essentially pull him through this, this course, um, which he was a good sport about it. <laughs> and pretty much anytime there was an uphill, we, you know, resorted to walking, but anytime there was flat or downhill, I would just kind of give him the signal to just keep moving. Um, whereas I think if I had to do it over, I would have been like, let's just stop and just assess this entire situation and how we're feeling because, um, you know, at the end of the day, it wasn't that important. But we're also in the middle of nowhere, so I was trying to get us back home on some yeah. level. Yeah, at um, some point you have to get back. Yeah, so obviously, I'm I'm curious to you know you're you're the you know you're the expert, but what what tips do you have for sort of dealing with adversity? Kind of like in, you know in sort of in the this is, it's going to sound weird, but like quote unquote in the heat of battle um, to to whether it's communicating with your partner or you know, anything you can sort of tell yourself to kind of get yourself in the right headspace? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think part of it is just seeing adversity as an opportunity that even though it feels bad, that it's like, you know, it, it, in sport, it's like a test of what you're capable of. But outside of sport, you know, shared experiences that are adverse experiences can enhance relationship connection because connecting around experiences helps us feel allied as we journey through the important pieces of life. This is a, a relational truth in sport and outside of it. There's actually interesting research on this that um, there's one study on uh, infertility related stress that partners who underwent a stressful event and saw it similarly were more likely to experience higher levels of relationship satisfaction. So if you're kind of in it together and, and sort of connected, it can be something that is really good for partnership. Um, in terms of 
communication during adverse experiences. I think the the thing that I'm I, so I do a lot of couples therapy and I do a lot of communication one on one and I'm curious how this communication tip would uh, work in swim run. But I often help couples to separate out two different kinds of communication. So one is problem solving, where the obvious goal is to solve a problem. So like if you have an obstacle or, or one person is bonking and the other person is doing well, sometimes it makes sense to like do problem solving. Like what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? How are we going to manage this, this challenge that is before us? But often what is much more useful is to have a discussion is just to kind of hear one another out. Where are you at? Because sometimes that conversation, which we call it a discussion and the, the goal of a discussion, unlike problem solving is just to deepen your understanding of where each person is out to be heard and to hear um, what's going on for the other person, what their emotions are, what their perception is, what their beliefs are, what their agenda is. And sometimes in that conversation of the deepening of understanding the solution just kind of presents itself because sometimes all you really need is for somebody to hear like, Oh, like my shoulder is out of whack. Okay. Gotcha. Like I'm there for you, but you just, there's nothing really to solve. You, you just kind of want mm-hmm. to be heard and feel connected in that, in that experience of communicating. Um, but even if you do then go on to do problem solving, having that discussion first to really understand where each person is at is really important because then you from there you figure out like what needs to be solved what needs to just be accepted what just needs to be connected around or you know if we do need to solve what part are we going to solve and do we both have a similar understanding of what the problem is so in terms of managing an adverse event in 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 swim run you know i i would sort of say like depending on where you're at, it's kind of helpful first to figure out like, you know, where are you each at? What's going on for each of you? Does anything need to be solved? If it doesn't, do you just need to sort of connect in it? And then if something does need to be solved, how do you do that in an efficient way so that your performance isn't, um, you know, hampered in some important way? But yeah, I I do sort of have that question because, you know, in the couples therapy room, I'm really talking with people about how to talk to one another and you're not necessarily talking that much during and during a race. So (laughs) it might not work the same way, but maybe some of those that some of those central tenets of like separating out uh, communication where you're just kind of checking in and getting a gauge of where each person's at versus solving something that has come up in a more proactive, like problem solving, like let's generate a solution way. Yeah, we we do do some of that checking in, sort of, especially during some of these longer events. It's like how you feeling, kind of thing, and that's not necessarily like how's the energy levels, but like you know how's the how's the mind, how's the body. That's kind of Chris's uh, thing that we've kind of picked up a little bit. So, so during some of these, we'll have these kind of micro check ins, if you will, about how are you feeling, and then you know now we've 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 had a big learning experience around sort of fueling and nutrition so now that's kind of another area or bucket that we're checking into is like how's the feeling been going or you know if i'm going to put a gel down i'll like hold it up and just like wave it at chris like hey just a reminder like don't forget kind of thing and that's sort of how how we keep it on on track but um I, I, I definitely think that you could have those conversations during a race. You don't have the luxury of like sitting on a couch and, yeah. and having somebody like guide you and, and coach you through it, which is obviously very helpful. Um, but you have to be more succinct and, and kind of direct uh, to the point during during the races. During the swim, it probably is going to be a lot harder. Um, but the run, yeah. I think it's probably a good application for chatting. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of chatting during the swims. <laughs> Yeah. But you guys, it sounds like you have these really lovely nonverbal ways of communicating with one another, like, of, here's where I'm at. Here's what we're doing. Here's where we're going. Here's what I'm not capable of, that, that you sort of uh, have some nonverbal communication that is pretty well understood by each of you. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and I, I think, uh, you know, that's sort of like a just trust. And also, we're so comfortable with each other. Again, we've done everything from you know, turkey trots with the kids to ultra marathons to 200 mile bike races and, you know, pretty much every type of event you could do. So there isn't anything I think that's like, so, you know, so, so kind of like out of the realm of possibility of stuff that we would do anyway, that, 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 and, and, and with that, I think there's just, as we've been talking about, there's just been a lot of reps between the two of us that just makes it easy to kind of like, yeah, I can just look at Chipper or, you know, when Chipper stops talking, I know something's wrong kind of thing. Cause he's 
he's a chatterbox um, <laughs> in, a, in a great way, in a great way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but, but I'm curious, you know, I want to ask you, Yael, you know, you used, you used to, uh, you, you rode crew in college, so you're familiar with sort of like team dynamics where some synchronicity is helpful and in crew, I mean, it's almost like mandatory. I mean, it's mandatory. <laughs> Um, what, what advice do you have for like swim runners in general, whether you're starting off or super experienced to, you know, or, 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 or what can we learn from team sports where synchronicity is, you know, helpful? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the science of synchronicity is actually pretty cool because if you, what, what scientists have found is that like when bodies are moving in motion together, that there's some like you can enter into flow a lot more easily. And so part of what is helpful is to really tap into what your partner is doing and sort of get into their flow as much as yours, like to sort of share a flow together because it helps each of you access a sense of flow. And, you know, the more that you can sort of connect physically and make that process automatic, sort of enter into one another's like movement and motion, the easier it is to kind of push yourself because it, it kind of becomes almost automatic. You're sort of in that sense of rhythm with one another. Um, I mean, crew is also interesting because the coxswain does the thinking for you. So you're actually kind of turning your brain off and really just accessing that rhythm together um, and trying not to think too much. Uh, which I think is pretty different than swim run because one of you has to be thinking. Probably. Actually, I mean, there is a little, so there's a piece of equipment called the tether. It's literally a piece of rope that you're tied together with I partners. I was reading about it and I have yes. questions about it. <laughs> we have like 10 episodes so we, we can send you. Yeah, we still have questions about it. But uh, <laughs> so we've been, uh, we kind of joke like, oh, this is like almost the umbilical cord between the two partners. But yeah. very much, I mean, Chris is mostly leading most of the runs, but he can feel based on how taut that rope is about how much ass I'm dragging because the thing will be like a guitar string or it'll be, you know, like, oh, there'll be some slack in it. Okay, maybe Chris can pick it up a little bit or I have a little bit more to give there. So that's been one massive nonverbal cue that we've been able to really, yeah. um, once we kind of like discovered it, we're like, oh, wow, we this is really something that can, it, it actually, we both agree that it, we felt like it elevated our athletic ability by having yeah. this, this, piece of rope tied between us Do yeah you, and i think there, on the is there like too, a tautness that is ideal that you know like we're both in flow together it's like not too too tight not too loose is is there one sort of a tautness that you're looking for it should be stiff <laughs> yeah it should be, yeah it should it no should uh, i think the person in the front's hip shouldn't be getting all out of alignment or something from it but yeah but i think also in the swim i mean that's one where where you know if tipper's leading the swim I, all i really need to do is stay on his feet like i'll sight just because you know it's a good idea for everyone to be sighting making sure everyone's going the right direction but other than that it's pretty much just like you know we've talked about what pace it should be and chipper just sets it and we'll just go um, and if we've made decisions as to when we're going to switch off on the swim or whatever, um, we have like a, you know, nonverbal communication system for that in the water where I just tap his foot a couple times on which side I'm going to pass. So, you know, super advanced, you know, communication High stuff. Level, yeah. It needs to um, be coded. But, uh, code. but yeah, but, but. Do you have a Morse code that you tap? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Four taps is shark. Three taps <laughs> is, I don't, I'm not sure. Two taps I'm passing. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's 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 interesting because I I really hadn't thought about it like the ability to get into some sort of group flow state. But we've definitely have gotten into those states in races where we're both, you know, we cross the finish line, we're both feeling you know super elated with the performance or whatever. But usually it's less about the the time result and more about how how, it felt. how we moved through the environment. Yeah, the execution yeah. of everything. So in rowing, the coxswain will some you know regularly call it like power tens to sort of get the cadence up and to get the boat moving you know with mm. in flow together. Do you guys have anything like that where you know you're sort of like at a at a moment in a race where you could really kind of come together and push forward? And how do you communicate that? Mm. Well, I think on swims we usually do it like heading into the swim. Like we'll we'll just spend like you know a couple beats and just. You know, like if there's a team in front of us, we want to get on their feet so we can take advantage of their their wake. Um, 
you know, we'll call that out. Or if I'm leading the swim, Chip will be like, you know, get on his feet. I'm like, all right, cool. Um, same thing on the run. Like if we're going to make some move or if there's like a hill or something, like we, there might be some communication in terms of um, how we want to approach it. Or, if, you know, if yeah, there's definitely been races where Chipper, like he'll just, I'll just look back, like I mentioned earlier, and he'll just say, it's like, all right, you know, go for it. Or like, you know, I need, I need five seconds, like whatever it is. And it's super helpful, right? Because as, as, as the tethers tautness is some sort of haptic feedback, it's not, you know, it's not all knowing and it, it can only tell you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, in the swims, if I'm really dragging, Chipper will be able to tell because like the, like the tether, he'll, he'll really feel like he's pulling me. Or if I'm doing really well behind him, I'm just like slapping his feet the whole time. Um, I'm like, got to step it up. <laughs> yeah. It probably does give you some motivation. So when Chris is, you know, yeah. tapping your feet because he's getting on your on your legs, you know, you know, push push on. Push yeah, on. or I'm not just being like dead weight. <laughs> <laughs> but there there so, will be usually like a little micro, yeah, like some sort of pre-communication. I mean, we're talking like five steps before we jump jump in the water kind of thing. Like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna press to get to their feet, or I'm gonna do a like kind of a surge or something. Or from the back, if we're running, I'll be like, "Hey, I got I got more pace to give." I'll, I'll yell up to Chris or something so that he knows if we need to make a pass or, or make some maneuver that it's available. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Wait, I, I, this is a random question about the tether. Does it ever get tangled with other? swimmers and runners because at least in the swim it looks like sometimes everybody's kind of jumping in the water together and i'm just imagining like the the tether like people running into one another's lines oh, it, happened, yeah. it can certainly yeah. happen or you yeah. uh you Algae. know the famous uh you know on land one person goes around one side of the tree the other person goes around the other <laughs> and then it you know then it turns into like a looney tunes cartoon there for a sec <laughs> you're both running looking at each other like uh oh this isn't good <laughs> no, there's a tree behind us in the um, middle of us somewhere yeah so it happens um typically and this is some insider swim run stuff which you definitely will never use in 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 your daily life yell but um you know the person in the back in the swims your, it's your job to make sure the tether doesn't get tangled. The person in the front just swims straight and the person in the back sort of defends the tether Got it. Uh, because it's sort of in the midline. So, you know, it's your job to, you know, kind of keep people off of it as best as, as you can. And in the run, it's it's kind of the same thing. That, so everyone needs to have sort of their wits about them to make sure that you're, um, that's not getting caught on things and things like yeah. that. And sometimes you'll, you know, we'll just take the tether off because it's so technical or it's just so ridiculous that yeah. it just makes sense to take it off. It does seem like a really nice metaphor for relationships of like, you know, how close do you want to be? And sometimes does that connection interfere with your ability to navigate, you know, whatever's coming before you on yeah. your yeah. journey? And sometimes it keeps you connected, but sometimes it maybe is keeping you like overly connected. And so can you loosen up the connection? It's It, it seems like a really good metaphor for a lot of relationships. It, it really well, is yeah, now we, that you, uh, you know, put some put some brains behind it thank you <laughs> we, we also always joke that uh you know sometimes like if we're not like we'll be like oh we weren't tethered but you know the psychic tether <laughs> yeah. is there so there, the psychic tether is, is always there when we're doing the stuff like we just did a pretty big run over the weekend um you know we're recording this on a monday on you know saturday we we did a pretty big run in, in the headlands near us and you know psychic tether was definitely connected but we didn't have a physical tether because people would have thought we were a couple of idiots doing this, this trailer <laughs> yeah. i'll tether it up Although maybe it's a way to get more people interested in the sport. You can like have a sign on your back that says, we're doing a swim run. We're not insane. Yeah. <laughs> well, Chipper Here's did a good job. Uh, He's always good. PR. I just yeah. run PR for swim run. He just started series. talking to some dude. And then that guy at some point was like, all right, He's I'll like, see, see you guys later. later. He just like st- started huffing and puffing up the sail just to get away from us. He but... found a second surge somehow. When I started really, uh, talking <laughs> to him. Yeah. <laughs> What what do you think are your most um, significant communication challenges? What what is hardest about communicating? I mean, it doesn't sound like you have much conflict. You're sort of on the same page. But what would you want to be if there's not sort of a huge challenge? What would you want to be improving on? If I had you on my couples therapy couch, wow. what would your goal be? <laughs> yeah. For Chris to unload the dishwasher more. Yeah. <laughs> the dishwasher comes no, up a lot in my, sure. in my office. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's, we hadn't thought, I haven't thought about that before. That's why you're on Yale's couch yeah. right now. I'm sweating. I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm sweating. 
What would I guess if we really wanted to we could probably be riding energy levels a little bit more about like for this run, if it's going to be a mile and a half, like we could probably be more communicative about pace, like in these immediate kind of short things. But I don't know for us, that's sort of those sort of check-ins to me, at least kind of feel almost a little bit like um, the opposite of kind of being in that flow state is like the flow state is we, we know how fast we can sort of move, I guess, if that makes sense. But rather than like, oh, okay, I can actually press like 10 seconds or 15 seconds faster per mile here. And I guess we could be could be doing that. But that is also not really aligned with with the the goals that we have is is not to be necessarily like, how can we get up to the to the edge and ride that line of like performance physically every every time. Um, but but that's just my. my, my yeah, I mean, it's half. it's an interesting question because what I initially thought of was we did this race where um, a local race in California where we were really, I think the only swim run team that had any major experience yeah. of this thing. And the first swim chip, chipper led it. And then usually I just take over on the first run and kind of set the pace, but chipper just like felt great and just like went for it. Right. And I was just like, Oh, okay. <laughs> this is, this is interesting. Um, and uh, you know, he didn't communicate that. Yeah, this wasn't true. wasn't pre you know wasn't pre planned or anything like that. He was just feeling the juice, and um, I think um, his buddy his buddy Nate was there just randomly. So helped, I think yeah. I think that got him kind of like pumped up, and we just like started going. I was like, all right, here we go. Um, so so kind of like him to me that that felt like an audible on his part, and I was just like, oh, this is super fun, right? That he's just like, all right, go for it. So I think on on some level, like not communicating was 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 refreshing um and i think if if we do need help with communication i mean it's probably just super like nuanced stuff right like um could we do a better job communicating during events like is there room for growth and i'm i'm sure there is but um at this point i think because we have such a our our swim run partnership is based in a friendship before anything else it's, you know, it's just if if someone if I'm having a bad day, I don't think Chipper particularly cares, um, as long as you know we're still having fun, kind of thing, and it's and it's the same vice versa. Yeah, I mean, you guys kind of get an A plus in communication. It sounds like you feel really good about it, and it works really well. Like that, you're really on the same page, and that you're able not not like comfortably on the same page because you're pushing yourself. You're doing these things these you're doing swim run which is intensely hard and complicated but you're doing it with a sense of joy and connection and a sense of um shared value and trying to like see what you're capable of but also holding the outcome lightly and really focusing on the joy of the journey and i think that that's sort of you know the ideal like what what people really aspire to in relationships so it's amazing do you do as well with your wives <laughs> Try to. Try to. (laughs) Try to. Are your wives Um, jealous of your relationship? (laughs) Well, actually, I think I think our wives are really happy that we have this type of relationship because I think um, I know my wife Susan has mentioned this, and I think Kristen has mentioned this as well that she's just glad that we're doing this together and that we have each other to kind of look after each other, so they're less worried about us doing these like crazy feats of endurance because you know they know we're gonna like make sure that the other person, you know, the, yeah, the other like person's coming back. Up, you know. <laughs> You'll bring you know, each other back. <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, but I'm, I'm curious for you, Yael. So, yes, so we've been doing this for a while and I think we have some pretty good good things. But if you were to advise, say, like new swimmer teams that are sort of beginning their journey and we're talking about sort of developing shared values and, and things like that, what, what are some, you know, from your vast experience, like what are some good places to start and either – talking about shared values or even coming up with those values should even look like in the first place? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. And, the you know, I always like to start by explaining what values aren't, which is that they aren't mm. goals. So if, like, the metaphor is a race and your goal is to get to the end of the race and do pretty well, that's actually a great goal, but it's not a value. A value is more how you take the race moment to moment. It's, like, the how of the journey in any pocket of time. And so if you can think about values as 
as more like an adverb rather than a noun that helps you to kind of hone in. And, you know, sharing values, I think you've given some really good examples of like, you know, being a supportive friend, being attentive to where each person is at, being flexible moment to moment, you know, working your hardest to do your best, but also, you know, not sort of getting so hung up on that, that you forget that what you're really doing is, is doing a shared journey that is really about your friendship. Um, but questions that you can ask yourself that have to do that that help to clarify values are sort of questions like, "What do I want to stand for moment to moment in this race? Um, when I look back on this race, what would I be most proud of having? How would I be most proud of having showed up?" Um, mm. And then the other thing to remember too is that values are flexible; that they're really context dependent. So, kind of exactly as you guys are talking about that, your value might be to like push as hard as you can moment to moment, you know, while staying connected, that's a good value. But that if one of you sustains an injury or you hit an obstacle, that you might shift the value to checking in with one another and making sure that you're physically safe. So to remember that you want to have like sort of overarching values and the superordinate why, but that you want to be flexible with which values in the driver's seat, depending on what's going on. So again, the values are the how you're taking the journey, but you always want to remember that the how may shift based on what's going on inside of you or around you or between the two of you. And um, that it can provide a compass moment to moment, even as you're sort of heading towards this ultimate goal that is a shared goal as well. Yeah, I, I that's that's obviously very strong advice. <laughs> but uh, okay. the flexibility piece I, is, is so key because, I mean, you know, we... Chris and I were recovering triathletes and, and, you know, there's many people who, who are triathletes as well that do swim run very much like you swim this far, you run, th- you bike this far, you run this, like there, this is, it is what it is. And in swim run, it's like the complete opposite. Like you need to be able to go with the flow and things change on a regular basis. So having space for that flexibility is I mean, I, I think that's probably one of the most key key things about some of the stuff that that you mentioned there, and and sort of having having the different goals and the flexibility to, uh, you know, substitute in different goals when when things are are tougher or totally. you're, uh, you know, give a little bit of uh, leeway on certain. Yeah, things and too. that kind of blows my mind too because like the way we usually talk about it is like, hey, if you're gonna enjoy swim run, you have to really become comfortable dealing with ambiguity. And I mostly thought of that as of just like, oh, this is just a process thing. But that that in itself is a value, right? To to be to sort of built in that flexibility to sort of embrace the unknown and the sort of everything is ish in terms of distances. And maybe there's an aid station there, but maybe there's not. So <laughs> if that's gonna give you a panic attack, then you know, you're in for a bad day, or if you can just kind of roll with it. But uh, yeah, but I hadn't thought about that as a value. But when you mentioned that, I mean, it, it definitely is. Yeah. Well, I like how you articulated it as embracing uncertainty, right? Sort of being willing to to be present, even though you don't really know what's coming up in the next moment and being not necessarily being okay with it because by its very nature, the human brain does not love uncertainty. In fact, we're sort of wired to try to overcome uncertainty and make things more certain, but sort of recognizing that discomfort and getting comfortable with the discomfort and being willing to tolerate it together and trusting one another. And I think that that's actually another value that you guys have articulated, which is that you've really worked on building your trust and in the moment being trusting of one another, you know, when Chris is in the lead in the run or, or, or chippers in the lead in the swim and one of you makes a decision that in that moment the value is okay i'm going to have faith in in their decision making process and follow and and you know keep pushing even though i'm not exactly sure what motivated that choice mm-hmm, so it's mm-hmm. trust in the uncertainty yeah like chris is like why is chipper taking off like a bat out of hell after the <laughs> swim for no good reason <laughs> i'm gonna go with it <laughs> let's go with it Love it. <clears throat> Love it. Well, Yell, we've kept you for a while. Um, really can't thank you enough. For folks at home, she has this amazing, this is a shameless plug, but she has an amazing <laughs> newsletter called Relational, The Art and Science of Connections. We'll link to it in the show notes. You should definitely sign up for it. It comes out twice a month. And Chris Chris is a, a huge part of that newsletter, so <laughs> <laughs> he and I are doing it together, and I trust him. <laughs> <laughs> 
um yeah so thank you so much for the for the knowledge y'all i mean really can't yes. thank you enough this was, this was amazing so it was so you. much fun it was such a fun opportunity to learn about a sport that i knew nothing about and so maybe i will come and support you on the cape <laughs> that would be so awesome to be your sweet. cheerleader awesome sweet all right take cool. care well thank you so much thank you that's it for this week's episode Thanks so much for listening to the show. Make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a wet rating or review since that's the best way to help other people discover the show and the sport of swim run. Check out our website, lowtideboys.com. That's boys with a Z for swim run resources, including gear guides, tips, how-to videos, and so much more. Make sure to check out our meme page at the Low Tide Boys on Instagram. If you have any questions or suggestions for the show, Send us a DM or email us at lowtideboys at gmail.com. We'd like to thank Riding Easy Records for our show music and, of course, our wives for their support and tolerance of our swim run and other activities. Lots of activities. Lots of activities. <laughs> Finally, you can support our efforts on Patreon. Until next time, get out there and go for a swim. Then a run. And then a swim. Then another run. Then another swim. Then run some more. Just keep going. Let's go. And then stop at some point because, you know. And fuel. Don't forget to fuel. Got to fuel, too. Of course, yes. Yeah. <laughs>